Uh, there were just too many problems, and it wasn't being fixed by that vendor. We were introduced to Rob and his team, and I got to tell you, we could not be more pleased at Cal. I'm able to feel very, very secure that we have the right IT partner assisting us. Um, so that's how we came together. Uh, and why don't we transition uh, on to some myths about cybercrime for our discussion today. Yeah, so at this point, cybercrime, at, at this point, Joe, it's, it's a full-fledged business. And I don't, I don't I, you know, it it's, pains me to say that, but uh, that's just the reality of it. It's I mean, these guys have business plans and everything now, these, yeah, these cyber criminals? It's, it's a sophisticated, they've become very sophisticated, very well-funded, well-organized. And unlike businesses like ours, they don't have to follow any rules. So they can kind of do what they want and do so uh, with abandon these days. So before the webinar started, you had made a mention of, and I thought you were kidding, but maybe you weren't, that there's basically a help desk for cyber criminals to call in. And it, is this a joke or is this for real? Uh, unfortunately, it's actually accurate. So, uh, you know, a lot of the hackers are using kind of automated tools uh, to go ahead and scan networks uh, to see who might be, have, who's uh, vulnerable. And uh, sometimes they run into, you know, just like all of us, run into some technical issues. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they have opportunities to go ahead and talk to the, uh, you know, the hacker help desk. Wow. And uh, go ahead and get some assistance so they can go ahead and try and hack us. I'll we'll see if this works itself into the GDP overall. All right, so let's discuss our goals for today, Rob. All right, so goal number one is to review and just demystify key myths about cybercrime to enhance cybersecurity. Uh, number two is to get tips to protect yourself and your business from cyber thieves. And finally, to learn about services that can improve your cybersecurity. And Rob, we have a special prize at the end of this webinar today. Would you mind discussing what it is? Yeah, so one lucky winner uh, will be getting a free one-year license for Office 365 for their personal or family use. And uh, that will include the you know, full version of Microsoft Office, Word, Excel, Outlook. And they can go ahead and use that for a year and up to, I think up to five devices. They can stick it on their iPad and all that kind of good stuff. That's one heck of a parting gift for today. Well, excellent. And uh, we predetermined uh, the, uh, the number, the, the person who is going to be the winner. Um, but we'll, we're going to unveil, uh, unveil that at the end. We quite simply had uh, selected, you know, somebody that was going to enter into our webinar today and we picked a magic number out of a hat, but we'll get there at the end. Uh, let's get started with um, our first poll question, though. Uh, and the first question is, how many of you have personally experienced cybercrime? And Rob, how do they answer that poll question? Yeah, so if you look at, uh, you should see on your screen, uh, uh, the poll options would be a yes or a no. Uh, so a way we can define what we consider to be cybercrime. Okay, so I've had my email hacked before. Is that a cyber crime? That would be considered a cyber crime. Bank fraud? Bank fraud. Somebody goes in and changes my password? Changes my password, or even uh, maybe you have, a, um, you know, have some bank fraud where some money got transferred out of your account, or you got infected with some ransomware. Perhaps. Well, I'm seeing the poll. I don't know if the attendees can see the poll as well in progress, but right now we have an overwhelming 75% say yes. Now it dropped down a little bit. Uh, but the overwhelming majority, we're at 67% of the participants are at yes, 33% have not suffered a cyber attack. All right, so the overwhelming majority of folks have. Why don't we get to myth number one here? And uh, this is one that I hear regularly, and I'm sure you do too. Let's discuss it. So true or false, banks will make me whole again if I am hacked. Okay, so at this point, many of us uh, as businesses are using online banking applications uh, to go ahead and uh, handle our banking transactions. And so that's, you know, many of us, we have uh, trust in our vendors, including our banks. And so when a problem comes up, uh, we expect our vendors to go ahead and fix that problem for us, right? So you would think, hey, if my, uh, if my bank account has gotten hacked, you know, I'm hoping that my bank is going to take care of me. But uh, the unfortunate uh, truth at this point is that that is not the case. Uh, unless you go ahead and uh, catch that uh, unauthorized transaction same day. If you are noticing that this transaction happened a couple of days ago and you go to your bank and say, hey, save me here, you know, I just got, I lost 10 grand in this unauthorized transaction, you're pretty much SOL. Yeah, uh, you're toast at that point. Toast. So it's really staying on top of it and notifying your bank immediately exactly. at the uh, first thought of suspicious yeah. activity. And the other, the other point here is uh, around, you know, people think, oh, what about FDIC? Doesn't that protect me? So what that protects us against is 
bank going under. Right. right. It's not has nothing to do with uh, you know money getting pilfered out of your account in an un unauthorized manner. So uh, the current evidence is that uh, small businesses are becoming more and more targets uh, for this type of online fraud. Uh, they do have valuable data that they need to protect. Uh, and they also have, tend to have less sophisticated defenses. So right. hackers are going towards that and as low hanging. You know what I'm seeing from our clients here is there's, there's a high level of phishing scams out there. And I had written an article recently around what banks are dubbing the CEO scam. And that's where a hacker or a hacking group gets in, figures out the CEO, hacks into the CEO's uh, email account, um, and then is able to track the CEO, see who the CEO reaches out to, see how they send their emails, what language they use within. And then um, once they have the opportunity of knowing the calendar and the schedule, then trying to get money out of the CFO or somebody in the accounting side um, to have them, have them uh, wire a uh, specific amount of money to a undisclosed wire account. And that's where a lot of folks are getting tripped up and running into issues. And unfortunately, the banks won't make you whole uh, if you fall prey to that sort of deception. So it's real and it is scary. Yeah, we've had that similar, uh, you know, a client of ours uh, uh, had gotten an email uh, and their accounting department went ahead and uh, unfortunately sent a, the hacker basically a scan of uh, a canceled check. Yes. And so they had given away basically the account number as well as the routing number and the company basically had to uh, go ahead and keep a really close eye on the banking account to make sure there wasn't any uh, issues with the account. Now there is some sort of insurance cover available out there and it's called social engineering coverage. Social engineering coverage. Uh, coverage is all over the map by insurance company. Um, some carriers at, can have the ability to add that onto their crime insurance form. Others have the ability to blend it into their cyber insurance form. Now your broker partner is going to know which route to go and which the smartest way is for your company, but I can't impress this enough that just because you have an insurance policy, that is a risk, a, a form of risk management, but not the form of risk management. And that's why it's essential that we have professionals like Robin and Tivix uh, in our lives as business owners. Um, let's transition then to tips for safe banking. Now, Rob, you've developed a few tips for safe banking here. Um, please do share. Uh, so some of these might be a bit controversial, uh, so we should talk about that a bit. Uh, but these are best practices at this point in time given the nature of uh, the landscape uh, of cybersecurity from an online banking perspective. Uh, debit cards. Now, this is one of those things where you're managing, you know, security on one side versus convenience on the other. So uh, as you increase your level of convenience, right. you tend to reduce the amount of security. On the flip side, you know, the higher the security levels, the less convenient things become and things become a bit more cumbersome. So uh, tip number one, cancel your debit card. So I'm going to go out and cancel my debit card, Rob. This, how realistic is this? Uh, well, it's going to become more and more realistic over time. Uh, this is a uh, one of those things where, I mean, this here's, here's the reality. The reality is you go to a gas station. Yes. Uh, hackers are putting in card skimmers into the slots. I've heard of this. Stations, and the person goes ahead and pops in their debit card, and at that point, the credential has been uh, compromised. And then you start getting, you know, a couple weeks later, you get a, a brand new card in the mail. Right, and they don't tell you exactly what happened. Right, they just get a you just get a new credit card. Uh, so that's an example of one of the ways that uh, kind of that this stuff gets triggered. Wow. Uh, next bit, having a dedicated PC for online banking. So this would be more for I would say more businesses. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, so we have a, perhaps an accounting team, yep. and they want to go ahead and they're doing some online banking. I want to go ahead and dedicate a PC in that office for online banking transactions. And I don't want to be using that computer for email or social media or web surfing or any of that stuff. Got it. Because uh, I, I want to basically protect that computer. Uh, number three, setting up two-factor logins. Now this is one that, this is beyond bank accounts. Okay. This is any sort of, any sort of online account that you use that is of any consequence to you personally. So I'm talking about a Facebook, I'm talking about a Twitter, a LinkedIn, uh, your bank account. Uh, any sort of vendor accounts. Oftentimes, uh, you're going to have an option uh, with the in the settings of these logins. Once you've logged in with your profile, 
to enable what's known as two-factor. And that basically means I'm going to be logging in with my username and my password, right. and then I'm going to go ahead and put in my cell phone, and I'm going to get a text uh, on my phone. Okay, right? the and text verification. Exactly. Now, what does it mean? I, I thought it was going to be like that little picture we're supposed to select when we're doing our online banking where they're, I don't know if you're familiar with this, it's a picture of a gumball machine or a giraffe or whatever. And I, I never understood what the purpose of that picture was. It just pops up for me. Is this also what you're talking about as part of a part uh, two-factor it's, it's login? It's related. So that's basically what they're looking for there is basically uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of, you, know, you, have, you see this a lot with like, say, like Ticketmaster. Yes, right. I'm gonna, I do. I'm going to buy some tickets online and uh, they want to basically validate that it's not a, a robot. Uh, that's going and trying to log in and doing a kind of an automated login. So, I see. So that's protecting against that sort of thing. But uh, you know, with regards to the two factors, sometimes uh, you know the you know the the account that you're trying to log in will actually have a separate application or app that you can install on the phone, or it could be just the text to your phone. Okay. Uh, so basically, the idea is something that you know, which is your user and password, and something you have physically, which is your phone, um, and that will you know, increase the level of security to your, uh, to your login. Uh, next thing is you know, setting up some email alerts. Uh, so this you can do very easily with your bank account. Uh, I want to know if I get a, I want to get a text to my phone if any transaction above a certain amount is triggered. Okay. So that's going to be kind of my, that's my alarm bell. That's my canary in the coal mine. Now, it's just an email or a, uh, a verification or a note pops up on my cell phone? Correct. It'll okay. say something like, hey, you know, you know, a transaction, you know, withdrawal over $100. Yes. And it's just kind of a note to warn you. Uh, so that's a very good thing to uh, go ahead and implement. Uh, for any sort of wire transfers, require signatures for that. Uh, multiple signatures in some cases, depending if the, if the company is quite large. Um, and that will go ahead and reduce... Uh, the level of risk from these kind of a CEO type of scams. You, you know, and I was just thinking about that too. With with most of the cyber deception scams that we're seeing right now, it is revolving around wire transfers. And in talking to one of my clients the other day, you, and they had they had fallen prey to it as well. Now, luckily, the bad guys hadn't gotten away with any money, but they were darn close to it. And it was a real conversation topic where the whole accounting team got together. The CFO sat down with the director of finance and their internal accounting team, and they really had the um, discussion around, look, if you get an email from one of us saying to make a wire transfer, we're going to have a verbal, we're going to verbalize this communication. We're not just going to rely on the email. And I think that really is just so important. These, these wire transfers really is where I'm seeing the bulk of the uh, crime uh, claims coming from. Yeah, so to kind of add to that point, so, you know, the accounting department is getting maybe sometimes they kind of uh, frame it in a way where it's like kind of this urgent thing. Absolutely. It has, right has to happen. Otherwise, the deal is going to fall through and it's going to be all their fault and they want to be the hero the accounting person wants to be, and these things come in late in the day too from what I, from what I uh, understand and talking to folks, and they, they just want to be helpful, right? They say, oh my gosh, this deal is on the line. I've got to make sure that the CFO is, is happy with me, and they think they're doing a great job and a service for the company, and really they're just um, you know, shelling out 60, 70, 80 grand to the bad guys via wire transfer. Absolutely. So another thing that you can take advantage of is maybe separating money out across multiple accounts to minimize the fraud. So uh, business accounts are, you know, up to 250 grand. Uh, anything above that, you know, uh, banks aren't going to cover above that. Yep. So you know, want to kind of try and keep you know less money than that and spread yep. it out ac across multiple accounts, and then get, carry some crime insurance. Yeah, the crime about. coverage again, and it goes back to number one or my point earlier, which is you know, transfer of risk through an insurance product is a way of risk management, but not the way of risk management. And I can just not stress that enough. Um, all right, so let's move forward past the tips for banking. And here's myth number two, and this is one that happened to me a couple of years ago. I was out with a uh, university client of mine, and their head of IT, their in-house head of IT, we were talking about cyber crime, and the person turned and said, hey, you know what? We are operating all on Macs, and Macs are not hackable. We don't have any cyber concerns whatsoever. And he was adamant, and I'm not an IT professional, so I don't – I don't have a way, or I did not at the time have a way to debate this gentleman over um, what his belief was. But Rob, clarify this for me. Are Max hackable? So I would say that that was true uh, several years ago. Okay, so he wasn't putting so, me on three uh, years ago? I, so let's just let's talk about hackers at this point are following the money. So five years ago, 90% uh, of the world's computers are running on Microsoft. Okay. Uh, since that point, uh, you know, Apple has, you know, they're the kind of wonder kid, comeback kid. You know, they were yes. left for dead 
many years ago, and then Steve Jobs kind of came in and kind of turned the company around. They started releasing some, you know, cutting edge products, iPod, iPhone, uh, iMac, those kinds of kinds of devices. And then what happened is that, you know, Apple became the, you know, the new sexy alluring product, right? And so it's become more more uh, more popular, right? So executives are carrying around their nice Mac. Mac, MacBook Airs and all sorts right. of stuff. And so IT guys have now had to support these types of uh, you know, devices and systems. Uh, and so what's happened is, as a result, Apple market share has, has, has increased. And so hackers, as I mentioned before, follow the money. So they're going to go ahead and start hacking Macs, and have done. So if you look, actually, the last year, uh, if you look at the vulnerabilities by operating system, 50% of them, Mac. So Macs are hackable. Microsoft. So Macs, okay. so Macs are hackable at the end of the day. So effectively, uh, I think the take-home point here is treat them like you would a Microsoft Windows machine. Okay. So Microsoft comes out with you know monthly patches to the operating system, just like Macintosh does. Apple does. They release patches. Basically, keep your stuff patched. You're going to need antivirus. You need malware, just like you do on the Windows side. You're going to need that on the Mac side. Uh, and so, you know, that shift has occurred over the last several years, and at this point, Macs are just as vulnerable as Windows. Uh, it's got to keep them, you know, essentially equivalent. And I don't want to go too far down the trail here, but, you know, let's, let's take this a step further, and our system becomes breached. What do we do the moment we know or the moment we believe there's a breach to our system? Uh, I would say, it, let's say it's a, uh, a virus infection and you start getting some weird pop-ups on your screen, uh, and it looks like it's something kind of serious, A, go talk to your manager and or IT person immediately and let them know. Talk about it. Don't, don't hide it under the ground or under the, you know, don't put your right. head in the sand. Make, you know, publicize it. Go talk to people. Number two, uh, if it's going to be a fast moving, basically unplug the thing from the network, power the machine down, take it offline. At that point, uh, that virus is not going to be able to spread to the rest of your network. Yeah. So I would say that you know, first two things to do is that you know, inform somebody and then get this, get that system off the network if it's if it's obvious. Time is yeah. of the essence. Time is of the right. essence because you know a lot of these infections right now, what they'll do is once you get the infection on your system, you know they're smart enough to go ahead and look around for any sort of network shares that you happen to be connected or mapped to. So you're talking about the public folder on your server yes. that has all your public documents and so forth, and it's going to go ahead and try to infect. Uh, so at that point, you know, you got to get that machine off the system as, much, as quickly as possible. Well, this could be a good transition point to the next slide, which, you know, really, how many new malware threats are being released per day? And I was shocked when I saw the, mil the million number, the number, yeah, one this, million. Yeah, this is uh, unfortunate but accurate. Uh, at this point, we're awash in vulnerabilities that are being released on a daily basis. Uh, so at this point, you know, it's just having multiple layers of protection in order to prevent some of this stuff. It's not just, it's beyond just having a firewall. It's beyond just having antivirus and malware protection. On you know, and it's so funny, a couple of years ago with cyber liability applications, those were the two featured questions was, you know, do you have a firewall? Do you have antivirus software? Check yes, check yes. Okay, you know, we'll, we'll offer you uh, some terms. And it's, it's become a lot more elaborate from there. Yeah, and I've noticed the same thing myself. You know, we've had clients that have uh, under Gone some uh, some audits uh, yes. from various uh, you know groups, and I've noticed how the, the questions themselves have changed over the past couple of years. Even actually just in the span of a year, even correct, uh, they've become much more complicated to resolve and answer, and they're looking for much deeper levels of you know, security protections that you know up to, up until a year or two ago weren't really in place. Uh, we're only, uh, unless you're, you know, had a you know, large compliance requirement. You, you had a great quote before we went live on this, and Rob, had, Rob said, having a firewall and an antivirus is like trying to stop a tank with a squirt gun. I mean, just imagine that. Uh, and I thought that was a really, uh, a really good way to put it. You know, a lot of times, too, I realize when there is a claim from one of the clients, it's really human error. You know, it's somebody that, when are we going to get rid of these memory sticks? It's something around a memory stick. It's something around leaving the laptop in the computer or at the client site or, or, or uh, in a restaurant or airport, something like that. It's, it's, there's so much human error that goes into it that really it comes down to, right, educating your um, accounting department around the CEO scams, but educating your staff too. 
don't just pick up a memory stick and plug it in your computer wondering what's on it. You know, you got to be careful with that. You've got to also inform your employees, look, you have sensitive data on your laptop, your iPhone. Be smart about this. Don't leave this stuff hanging out. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes back to the users because they're basically, not, right. like, it's just human nature. Yeah. Human nature is that humans are gullible. Treat, treat your iPhone like you would your wallet, right? You're not going to leave your wallet sitting on the yeah, I mean, sitting on your car seat as you go to run an errand. Yeah, mobile <laughs> devices are essentially supercomputers in your pocket at this point, right? Right. You got to have some protections in place. Um. So the next slide here is ransomware dangers on the rise, and this is such a big topic. Hey, we're going to tease it right here. All right. So this is a big topic. This actually is going to be our second seminar in the three-part series. This, of course, is uh, part one of our three-part series. Uh, so. Stay tuned, we're going to send out an e-blast uh, and uh, tease up our second seminar around ransomware. But maybe, Rob, you just want to talk about this real quick before we move forward. Yeah, I mean, basically, this has been uh, increasing in numbers, um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things, this is really nasty stuff. Yes. This is the type of thing that will grind your, 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 your network to a halt and stop your business. Uh, and it really becomes uh, a significant uh, you know, downtime cost, can be really excruciating. Um, you know, at this point, it's essentially effectively pure extortion. Yeah. So what happens is you get infected with this particular virus. It goes ahead and encrypts uh, the files that are in your my documents, for right. example, and then it goes out and starts looking for any sort of other network shares that you have available on your machine. So this includes your server, like I was mentioning before, and it then goes ahead and tries to encrypt. And at that point, you have two options. One. You're going to get a notice that basically says, hey, your files have been encrypted and locked, and you got to pay this extortion, you got to pay this ransom. This is kidnap and ransom, but for your computer system. Basically, yeah. And, and there's actually a, a form of insurance cover now starting to be built into some cyber liability policies. And I can't stress enough that not all policies are created equal. But there's a term out there, and if you folks want to write this down, it's called network extortion. Okay, and that's the form of insurance cover um, that helps in such a situation. You know, when you get that email from the person that's holding your systems hostage saying you either deposit $50,000 uh, and wire it to this account now or that's it. And the other part too is you could wire that $50,000 and there's no guarantee they're going to release your, they're going to give you the, the key. Is that what it's called? The so key yeah, to un undo your, it? Your unencryption or decryption key. Uh, so you may get your money, or you may get your files, you may not. I mean, actually, we're, we're dealing with hackers here. Right. You know, uh, not the most honest folks. Not the folks. most ethical people here. <laughs> right. right. And so, you know, what a lot of companies are doing is that they're, you know, basically having to go back to their backup systems. And this is where backups are super critical. Yeah. Having uh, a reliable backup, multiple copies of your backup, multiple copies in different locations, uh, and then, uh, you know, testing your, testing, do some test restores. Uh, part of it is, you know, also a lot of small businesses, you know, they have a lot of data on their on their servers these days, right? So, you know, it's not uncommon to see, you know, multi terabytes of information on, on on client file servers. And you think about that, if I need to restore, you know, four terabytes or eight terabytes yeah. of data, that's not something that's just going to turn around in a couple hours. I mean, this is something that's going to run for 24 hours. It's a huge project. 48 hours, yeah. and in the meantime, your business is down, right? And you're just twiddling your thumbs, right? So just, uh, you know, in 2016 alone, ransomware to date has, will cost American businesses $75 billion wow. in downtime. So that's huge. No, and that's, it's such a big topic that we wanted to make that part two in our, in our webinar. Let's, um, let's carry forward and actually go to our final myth of today. Uh, this is myth number three. Small businesses don't have anything worth stealing. They're too small, right, Rob? Well, that's <laughs> common common perception. You know, hey, you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not Target, I'm not J.P. Morgan. Uh, and, but the bottom line is that, you know, why would anybody want to hack us? Well, the problem is, you know, think about it this way. These large companies, large corporations, have very sophisticated security implementations. They have dedicated teams oftentimes. Uh, and, you know, they're not that easy to hack at the end of the day. Right. But they're still getting infiltrated. And so if the larger corporations with all these advanced security methodologies are getting hacked, then, I mean, what do you think a, a small business is going to be able uh, to absolutely. do? Absolutely. I think of a good friend of mine. He's one of the directors of security for Facebook. Uh, and that's all they're doing. It's a game of whack-a-mole all day long is, you know, figuring out how the bad guy got through, closing that patch, 
um, trying to chase after them. They work hand in hand with the FBI. But I mean, just as, when they take one down, there's three others that pop up. I mean, it's it, it, it's amazing. So when the large companies are getting into trouble, of course, it makes sense that you know these these hackers would want to go after that low hanging fruit, as you had mentioned. Yeah. So at this point, you know, 20 percent of small businesses are falling victim to this every year, and that number has been growing and steadily increasing. Right. Small businesses are the low-hanging fruit. You know, there's a certain kind of complacency among them. Hey, I don't have anything that's of, of any use. Uh, they don't have the sophisticated security protections that larger companies have. And at this point, half of all cyber attacks are aimed at small businesses, right? And why, why is that? Well, because hackers use automated tools to go ahead and uh, scan ranges of addresses out on the Internet, and they're looking for the low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, so they're going to go ahead and attack the ones that are, you know, responding and open, and uh, you know, are going to concentrate their efforts there. And the other thing is, like, you know, many small businesses, you know, you don't you don't really hear about small businesses, you know, making news because it's, you know, the national news is more interested in the big corporations and the big splash, right? right. They want to focus on the big story. If it bleeds, it leads. Exactly. Uh, secondly, most small businesses, you know, a don't have any visibility or even knowledge that they've been hacked. And, or they don't report it, and so why don't they report it? You know, because they're you know they don't know about it, right? Or they're perhaps embarrassed about it, or you know they're afraid of the you know kind of legal uh, or reputational consequences of that as well, right? Well, this brings us to our next slide, which is the hidden cost here, and this is this is mind-boggling. So two hundred and one dollars. Uh, the <clears> hidden <throat> cost of what? And so let me just we'll just open it up to the floor for a bit, and maybe you can. Uh, let me just share some ideas of what you think this $201 refers to. So if you maybe just enter it as a question here. Okay. And uh, we'll see what uh, some folks think, you know, this might be referring to. So we'll give that just a minute for folks to type it in and let's see what people come back with. All right. $201, the hidden cost of what? And we are nearing uh, the end of our webinar this morning, and so stay uh, – Stay tuned here because we are going to find out who the winner is of the new Office 365. Uh, what's the value of a gift like that? It's got to be over $500, right? Uh, no, not quite that, but it's, uh, yeah. Close to. Close to. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, okay, did anybody share any ideas uh, on... Uh, still waiting on some stuff here. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, help people out here. All right. So $201, that is the average cost uh, associated with a stolen record. Just one. Just one stolen record. And so this is talking about, you know, you know, think about this. This is, you know, I've been infected, I've been vulnerable, I've, I'm vulnerable, I've been uh, compromised, and it's a known quantity, and now I need to go ahead and, you know, uh, go ahead and do some credit monitoring yes. on my clients. Uh, so that's kind of factored into that. But that's only part of the equation here. So there's, this is just the start of, you know, the tip of the iceberg. You still have to deal with reputational damage to your client base, you know, to your to your business as a whole. You're dealing with potential loss of clients. You're also dealing with potential class action individual lawsuits that you're going to have to deal with. Uh, this is not including also legal fees associated with uh, getting things uh, squared away. Uh, compliance fines or non-compliance fines. Uh, data replacement costs. How am I going to recover this stuff that just got uh, hacked and, you know, um, you know, recover all this information that uh, has been compromised. And then you're talking about just, you know, the amount of downtime and loss of employee productivity that I'm having to deal with as a business owner. Right. And a well put together uh, cyber liability policy will address a number of these hidden costs. Um, you can't transfer that risk. But again, say as I started in the opening here, it is a form of risk management, but not the form of risk management. So security awareness. Okay. How do we train this end user of ours as we wrap? So as I mentioned, uh, you know, employees are the low-hanging fruit. Uh, so we recommend uh, mandatory regular cybersecurity training for all employees. Uh, so we include, included in this would be uh, some training around you know, ransomware, which we'll talk about more yes. in seminar number two. But basically getting people comfortable, you know, elevating the base security awareness of all employees because they're the ones that are taking, they're the front lines. They're the ones that are, you know, victims of these. And now we're starting to hear more about, like, phone scams. I've had this happen with a couple of clients where uh, one particular company is an auto dealership, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of turnover in their sales staff. And, you know, auto dealerships are not, you know, not the most tech-savvy folks, um, and there's a lot of turnover in the sales force, right? So we had one, uh, you know, one salesperson that uh, got a, was a victim of a phone scam, 
And so what happened was they got a, a phone call, they answered the phone. Uh, the uh, caller on the other line, end of the line basically said, hey, you know what, I'm noticing that uh, you got a malware infection on your computer and I need to go ahead and remote into your computer to take care of that for you. So let's get that situated. Unfortunately, that salesperson fell for it and allowed this remote user to go ahead and remotely control the machine and lo and behold, bam, infected them with malware that we then had to go in and clean up. Uh, so this is just an example of you know, elevating the base security awareness of all staff through uh, regular security awareness training. Uh, you know, some of the uh, kind of solutions out there these days will include even like fake phishing emails. I can do a campaign against my own users. I can go ahead and send a fake phishing attempt. Maybe we should just define what a fake phishing email is. So that's a fake phishing email is an email that folks will get that look, looks very legitimate. It may come from your bank. It may come from some other right. kind of, you know, a known entity. It says click here. It says click here. Hey, now I need to access your account. Um, but just by kind of visually doing some checks, in which we'll go over this in the next webinar, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, some of these are very sophisticated and can very easily trick a user. So, but this is the most common way that people are getting infected these days. Yeah, so chase fraud alert, click here, but then it comes from the forward address. Um, wow. So, but we can't panic about this. No, <laughs> we cannot panic. So, I mean, it basically comes back to just, hey, you know what? Fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, nothing, we're all, we're all vulnerable. So we have to basically at this point just be aware. We have to elevate and protect and elevate our just general knowledge. Uh, we have to take pragmatic approaches to reduce the amount of risk that we're faced with. And there's some kind of common basic things that we can do that can uh, at least minimize the risk that we're going to get. And, and I love what you had just mentioned a few moments ago, which is that a great IT partner can test the employee workforce. All right, and it's not to be punitive and not to embarrass people, but if you, the IT partner, is sending that, that test, that fake phishing test, it actually can be a very useful and teachable moment for the staff. Absolutely. I would imagine, undoubtedly, there's going to be somebody or a few people that are going to fall for that scam. You're going to be able to get the assessment and the report to the CEO, the CFO, the head of IT, whoever it is, so then it can be disseminated in a non-embarrassing way, but in a very teachable moment of, Absolutely. we've got 50 people here, 10% of the folks fell for this scam. Congratulations to those that didn't. But um, we've got to tighten it up because 10% is too much. We've yeah. got to get to 0%. Yeah, I mean, and let's be frank. You know, people are, you know, people are not trying to, you know, they're trying to do the right thing. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's, not, and it's not, like you said, like, it's not a punitive thing. Um, but we, there are ways that we can uh, protect ourselves. So, we're, so we'll run through this real quick. So we mentioned earlier, you know, firewall, antivirus, malware protection is not sufficient protection anymore. We need to go a step further. So we mentioned we need UTM. So what is UTM? Ah, question just popped up asking that. <laughs> yeah, so UTM is, uh, it's called, it's basically unified threat management. So think of this as basically layers of security. So a firewall is a particular, particular layer, antivirus on your servers and desktops or another layer, yes. malware, et cetera. Well, we need to add some additional layers to that. So one of the ones that we need to add or as a best practice at this point is what's known as uh, DNS filtering services. So you think about like spam filters. Right? Okay. So an email gets sent to Joe at uh, Cal Insurance, right? Uh, it goes through a spam filter service, right? And it basically the spam filtering service is going and kind of scrubbing that email, looking for any virus that happens to be in it, or maybe it's going to be categorized as a spam email, and it's going to be kind of you know just deleted from the system. You're never going to get that in your inbox. Yeah. Right. Likewise, uh, uh, same analogy, but web traffic, web uh, browsing. DNS filtering is basically doing the same thing and it's essentially cleaning your web internet traffic as you go through your daily work. So I happen to go to uh, uh, maybe a legitimate website, but that website has been infected with malware. You know, the filtering service is going to be able to detect that mm -hmm. and it's going to just prevent you from going to this known infected site and you're just going to you know, be able to prevent uh, that type of hap from stuff from happening on your computer. So that's what, uh, what we're talking right. about. We're was concerned. there another question that popped up too, Rob, as you're looking at that? Uh, the second point is employees need to be educated and tested. I think we kind of covered that. that. Uh, we talk about uh, professional grade backup. So we kind of mentioned, touched on this earlier. Multiple locations, multiple backups, multiple types of copies, multiple copies. 
I want, uh, backups at this point are critical and you want to be able to set yourself up so if there is ever an issue that you're not just relying on one type of backup and one, you know, because, you know, the backups, you got to be testing your backups as well. So this kind of feeds into having some sort of business continuity type of solution right. where, you know, you can basically withstand uh, this type of an infection and this type of downtime and, you know, get your stuff up and running much quicker. The ongoing monitoring and maintenance of security systems, this screams IT partner to me. As a business owner, I'm not going to be able to manage this process, but I need the right IT partner to be able to manage this Absolutely. process. Absolutely. Yeah, security at this point is not a point in time. This is an ongoing, things change, security levels change, security protections change, and you need, to somebody, you, need, you need somebody that's kind of tied into that yeah. and is able to provide appropriate recommendations to your business. So you can evolve over time because the threats are evolving all the time. Uh, next one. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, removing administrator rights from PCs. So, uh, you know, you go and go out and buy a home PC from Costco or, you know, Dell Online. You get that for your home and you go and set that up. When you log in for the very first time, you're logging in as full administrator. Yes. And so when you're full administrator, you can do whatever you want. You can install software. You can go ahead. And so viruses are taking advantage of that. So if you're running with administrator rights, by, the virus will go ahead and execute itself and propagate. All right. Well, if I remove my admin rights, how can I do things on my own computer, my uh, own home computer? Well, what you do is you set up two accounts. So you have, you know, Joe's regular daily use account that is a non-administrator account, and then you set up your Joe admin account. So anytime you need to make a change, you need to install a piece of software, you need to install. I a see. Printer, I get it together. Then you're logging in as Joe admin. You make the change. And then, but you're, as far as daily use, you're just logging in with your Joe non-admin account. And just by doing that, you're going to reduce uh, your level of risk pretty significantly, actually. 85% of last year's vulnerabilities and infections would actually be mitigated and not able to propagate an infector system had you not had administrator rights. That's a huge percentage. Yeah. So, um, we had a question pop up I can see here. It says, I'm a realtor and two months ago. Do you want to? Yeah, a client of mine saw a victim to someone spoofing my email address, creating an email address that looked similar to my email address. He almost wired 200 k uh, using that account, thinking that it was an initial deposit on an offer he made the day before. Would I have been at risk in this scenario if he fell for it? That's more for you, Jim. Yeah, I don't know if the realtor um, would have been at risk. Uh, unfortunately, the reputation certainly would have, and there probably could have been some blame here. Um, but I don't know on the exact liability issue. Um, cyber liability is for when you are breached, and I don't know more. I need to know more about the situation to see if you were breached. Now, if your systems were breached and their info got out, um, yes, then we'd have a network security issue, and that would trigger liability coverage. Um, but, and I think I know who this gentleman is. I will talk to him offline um, to learn more about the situation uh, to see if indeed that 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 is the case. Cool. Um, so we have to implement a mobile device policy and security protocol here. Yeah. So then, if you think about mobile devices at this point, uh, you know we're getting email, business email to our phones. Uh, we have, you know, kind of important confidential and or critical information that ends up on, in our email boxes, and those are being, you know, copied and propagated over to our mobile devices. So, you know, in our base, base implementation, uh, you know, there's not going to be a lot of security controls that uh, a business owner can go ahead and propagate across his, you know, fleet of mobile devices. So uh, by implementing a mobile device management framework solution, uh, a business owner can go ahead and control uh, those mobile devices. Right. They can set, can be, essentially you're creating a firewall or a line between personal data and business data. If a machine or if a laptop or if a uh, you know, phone gets compromised or stolen or lost, I can go ahead and just pull back the company information uh, and, or I can just do a full wipe on the device um, and protect my company data yeah. as a result, right? So that's what we're talking about there. Uh, next bit is securing home PCs and devices that access the network. Now, this is something that we've seen pretty frequently uh, in our IT practice where we have, you know, management or executives that, uh, you know, want to be able to do some work from home sure. and they want to connect from their home machine. So the problem here is that those home machines, are, you know, they may or may not be a managed machine 
that you know the IT provider is act actively managing. And I wonder if maybe that was how, with the realtor's question on there, how somebody was able to, to penetrate through and find out what the realtor was doing, who the realtor was communicating with, um, and really taking over the email uh, of that particular um, realtor. Yeah. So the more I think about it, I do think that there's network security liability um, cover that would pertain to that particular incident. Yeah. So a key home, uh, other uh, key point here is that you know with an unmanaged home machine, if I'm connecting up to my network with a VPN or something like that, yeah. and that home machine gets infected with ransomware, again, the ransomware is far enough to look at the network shares, the network drives that you have access to. So if I'm accessing my files on the server, I can potentially, across this remote connection, I can go ahead and infect my company files. Well, the realtor now, I, I think, would really be wise to have an IT security consultant look at the system because if it's been breached once and there hasn't been any um, any correction to it, what's to say it couldn't happen again? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's transition. Find out where your business stands as we um, as we wrap up here. This is our final slide before we tease you on our next webinar and announce who the winner is. Um, so in wrapping, where does our business stand? What do we do? Well, first, first step to do is uh, get a threat assessment. So basically, you know, what is my current, uh, what is the current status of my business as it is right now? You know, what devices are employees using? Uh, do I have an understanding of what third-party apps are running on my system? You know, are my, are my systems really backed up? What's my, uh, you know, what's my backup policies? Where am I at risk? You know, making sure that your, your network is, is fully protected. Uh, next part is making an action plan, ensuring that your systems and operations are secure from cyber theft, compromise, and corruption. Uh, step three, I uh, talk with Joe. Right. Uh, the cyber liability offerings. Not all policies are created equal or even remotely close. And I know after this webinar, Rob, you're going to send out the audio um, to the participants and also a one sheet that uh, has been developed around cyber liability insurance. Absolutely. Uh, okay, step four. Uh, having some sort of ongoing maintenance. So maybe you already work with an IT provider and they're doing some you know, recurring uh, maintenance on your network, which is great. Continue doing that. That's an important thing to do. Uh, if you're not, uh, consider it because it's, uh, like I said, with the threats, the level of threats today, it's really important to have a layered security and management and need to have eyes on this uh, in order to make sure that you're protected. So with that, uh, you know, Antivix is able to uh, help out folks. Uh, so what we're able to do, uh, we'd like to, you know, make an offer to you guys about a, you know, free uh, network security assessment. Uh, so the first uh, three folks that uh, drop me an email, and we have some information later on, uh, we'll go ahead and set up a free network assessment where we can at least tell you where you're at. Uh, you know, no, no obligation to do anything beyond that. It's basically, I, hey, you have the information. You can either at that point go talk to your existing provider if you have that, or you can go ahead and you know, engage with us, or just do nothing. That's fine, too. You know, right. Or maybe it's not fine, but right. uh, at least <laughs> you're can. making that decision and your eyes are wide open. Yes. All right, so our next webinar, we'd be thrilled if you would be able to join us. Uh, same time frame, about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, on Wednesday, October 12th at 11 a.m., another presentation by Antivix and Cal. And this is going to be, as we teased earlier, ransomware, number two in our three-part series. Hey, and tell your friends as well. It'd be great to get more folks um, to come join us. And now we get to find out who the big winner is for the new Office 365. Uh, that's going to be participant number seven uh, for today, and that is uh, Miniko Salinas. You are the winner. Maniko Salinas, congratulations. So you'll be getting an email uh, with a uh, redemption code for that, Maniko, and uh, we'll go ahead and take that care of that. You should get that shortly. And it was predetermined that lucky number seven was going to be the winner today. Um, all right, so with that, um, we'll open it up for questions for just, one, uh, for just another minute or two. So if anybody has any final questions, um, please type them in now. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer. and. Uh, yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention too is, you know, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys as to any other topics that you guys would like to hear about. You know, uh, if there's any other, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily about cybersecurity. If you have any sort of, uh, you know, IT questions or uh, insurance type questions that you'd like to see us uh, address in an ongoing or a future webinar, we'd love to hear that. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions, Rob, come through? Otherwise, okay. 
Yeah, and if you also have uh, suggestions for Bruce Bochy on how the Giants can revamp their bullpen in the offseason, that would be great, <laughs> too. Uh, uh, we got a couple thank yous coming in. Okay. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, uh, audience, for your participation and for your availability today. Uh, you know, I think this was a great uh, start to our three-part series. And uh, just want to, on behalf of Rob, thank everybody for your participation today. Appreciate it. All the best, everybody. We'll talk with you soon. Bye. Thank you.